Well, the common type system, like it says here, is what makes .NET programming tick and also is what all .NET languages must follow. It allows integrated with each other. So an array in C, C sharp is the same as an array in F sharp, right? It's the same thing. Or a class, the classes can be easily shared through all the languages because they all adhere to the common type system. This also creates type safety and, of course, high performance uh, code. Uh, the other thing is uh, .NET is completely object-oriented, allows you to do complete, true object-oriented programming. And like I said, finds the rules all languages must follow. At a minimum, all languages must follow the common type system to be a .NET managed code. The root of everything in .NET is an object. So if you come from other programming languages, it might be variants. Um, this allows basically any type to be easily shared through methods and things like that. If everything is an object, you can make very generic methods that will accept any type and then you can operate on it. System.object is a reference type, which we're going to talk more about the difference between a reference and a value type in a little bit. Value types, uh, which are numbers and things like that, uh, derive from object. Here I'm looking at a 32-bit integer and I'm going to go down and show you the base types. So here's the base types. The first base type will be um, value type and then the base type under that will be object. So that's the inheritance chain. That's just showing you uh, that even numbers inherit from object, even though they're value types, which we're going to talk about the differences. These other things you see here are um, interfaces. Common type system, there's two main types, all inherit from object, like this shows. The first uh, type we're going to talk about is what we call value type. It's really important to understand uh, these two different types because they live in memory differently. For value types, there's the built-in value types, numbers, everything else basically is reference. Uh, types like a Boolean, true, false, a byte, an N32, um, a double, an N16, and you know, it keeps going. There's a couple um, special things with value types. Is you can actually create your own value types because you know, .NET is very extensible and for, for them just to say, here, here's what you get and you can't do anymore uh, would be kind of suck. So, uh, you can create your own value types, uh, which are what we call user-defined types. And one of the user-defined types, enumeration, basically just a specialized integer. But you define what numbers are in that enumeration. So it actually falls under the user-defined type. Structures. Structures, and we'll talk about this too, structures are a way to create your own value types. Everything else is a reference type. Part of reference types are what we call self-describing, which are things like arrays, um, and then your own classes and your user defined classes. So this is most of what you're going to be creating when you're programming is this right here. Your user defined classes, which allows you to create a, you know, person, op, a person class and an employee class or there's interfaces. You just saw that on my demo. Uh, you can create interfaces. We're going to talk about that in a second. And then there's the built in ones like string and object. So type categories, and this really relates to uh, the memory, is uh, the value types are stored as the actual value in memory. And this, and they're actually created on what we call a memory, st a memory stack. The memory is reclaimed as soon as the variable you've created, like an integer or a double, goes out of scope. If you're doing number crunching and things like that, uh, this is, uh, of course, of a good way to go is to keep your numbers in a value type array or something like that. Reference types are stored as a reference to the actual values location. All reference types are created on what we call the memory heap. The memory is reclaimed when the garbage collector feels like it. Stack is the area memory um, allocated to keep track of the also the call stack and, and value types. It's like a stack of books in a library, you know, things go in and out uh, very quickly. Um, parameters are stored here when we start talking about methods. All method parameters are, are one way or the other a value type. The heap, everything else resides, maintained by the garbage collector. So the built-in value types, those are all the numbers and dates and booleans and things like that, are all the built-in value types. The user-defined value types are what we call structures. And every language, of course, defines a structure just slightly differently, but pretty much the same if you really look at like the difference between C Sharp and, and BB.net. Here's a user-defined type. It's a structure. Creating a structure is pretty easy. This is C Sharp, so here's a public struct uh, complex. So that's the name of the type itself is complex. Uh, we're doing a public, R, a double R and I, which are basically uh, public uh, fields. And um, 
So that's being defined right here. Uh, structures can have constructors. Uh, the only rule for a structure, which is different than a class, must have parameters. Commonly, the only reason we do this is uh, just to make it easy to set the actual fields or properties. Reciprocal. So property is a get property, and we're just sending back uh, whatever this division is down here. So uh, structures can have properties and methods, just like any other class can. And then down here, you can see we're actually overriding the uh, two string. We're actually overriding, which we'll talk more about later. The two string actually uh, comes from object. But enumeration is a way to basically represent different values basically in one number. But enumerations, you can actually represent multiple numbers in the same number by what we call bit flagging, which I'm, I'll show you just really briefly. And that's a good way to send multiple values in just by using one number. C sharp, here's a public enum. We call it root vegetables. We're representing three different vegetables basically within the same enumeration. The reason we use this is to basically cut down parameters and methods. You just code by doing root vegetables dot horseradish and zero will be represented for that. This is what we call a bit field. This is what I said in the last slide. They are basically, you can represent multiple values in the same number. And here you have to define the number. Uh, the first one always should be none or the default state or something like that. So here we actually have a none. And then we have a summer, which is one, autumn, two, four. They always have to double in, in, in value. But the cool thing is down here, I can represent everything by just oring them together. So here we I have a class. And we're calling it this awesome name called class one. <laughs> and in it, I have a public value as integer. This is VB, by the way, VB.net. Uh, we have a, I have a variable called uh, value, and I'm setting the uh, I'm setting as an integer. And in .NET, we can set the value at the same time we declare it. So I'm setting it to zero, which is actually the default value anyway for integer. So here I've, here's my test class. Actually, this is my wonderful console application. So here. I have value 1 as integer equals 0, right? And I have uh, value 2 as integer equals value 1. Then down here, I said value 2 equals 1, 2, 3. So here I'm defining a, a variable as new class 1, which is this class. Then I'm defining another variable called ref2 as class 1 equals ref1. Now I'm setting ref2.value equals 1, 2, 3, OK? What does ref one dot value equal? Who says one two three? Raise your hand. Who says zero? Because you have to remember this is really important when you're coding in .NET. See right here, ref one as new class one. What is ref one really? It's a pointer to class one. And when I'm doing dim ref two as class one equals ref one, you see there's no new over here. So what this is doing is is copying the pointer. Uh, ref two and ref one are the same thing. They're pointing to the same object in memory. And that's that's the difference between value types and reference types. Assemblies are construct are, are the construct used by a runtime to locate and load type. Assembly manifest contains the information that the runtime uses to resolve all that information. Type name in .NET uh, consists of two logical pieces. Uh, the first one is the actual assembly name. That actually is part of the type name. So if I had an assembly called my classes right and I had a and I created my own type in there called students the actual type name would be my classes dot students and the main namespace in .NET is called system is basically just a way to organize types if we didn't have namespaces in .NET then everything would be jumbled un underneath the uh, assembly name right and it's a really hard way to organize, and I'm really big on organizing types and, and assemblies. And namespace in .NET is just a really easy way to organize your types. And namespaces can take, do often, most often, contain other namespaces. So a namespace is not a type. It is part of a type name, but it's not a type. You can't instantiate a namespace. You can't call a method on it, because there's nothing there, really. You know, the one we use in, in .NET for data system dot data is where all the data stuff, your SQL Server, things like that are located under. So the cool thing is if we had to, some types get, some namespaces get really long, unfortunately. I, I used to know the, the longest one in .NET, but it's hundreds of characters. So if you had to type that out every time, uh, it'd be a real drag. C Sharp, you do uh, at the top of your class, or be actually before your namespace, spaces that are used inside your type. So here I'm defining the system namespace. And then down here, when I'm using console, I don't have to type out system.console. 
right? I can just do console and it finds it for you in the system namespace and calls it. A demo using reflector of namespaces uh, from my open source assembly, if you guys go check that out. So my assembly name is actually uh, done at tips.utility. That's my root namespace, right? But then I have all these other namespaces under here called, you know, IO and logging and math and net and security and threading and UI.web and UI.windows and things like that. So those are my namespaces. The first thing you'll see in Reflector are basically just the list of namespaces. And then under my namespace, I can see what classes and enumerations. I don't, there's no enumerations in here. That's an enumeration. But you can see what uh, methods or, or classes are in my namespace. So in this namespace, I have one called uh, textbox, right? And, um, but the one we're going to look at is controls helper. And that's a class. Uh, that's all the base classes. And then you can see all the methods inside of my class uh, by just clicking on these bold ones or the, or the public methods. So the cool thing about Reflector that uh, IL Dazzlin doesn't do, this is why I show you guys this, is I can go into any .NET assembly and look at all the code. Uh, you define a type by basically uh, creating a type from an existing type. Any attributes that are defined on the type and uh, the type visibility, which we're going to talk more about here in a sec, uh, how that type is visible inside and outside of the uh, assembly. Um, the type's base type, which in the end is always object, but you can inherit from any, not any type in .NET, but a lot, most of the types in .NET you can inherit from. You also define any interfaces uh, the type is, uh, is using, and we'll talk more about interfaces here in a second. And then, of course, the definitions for the members themselves. And the, when, I, when I refer to as the type members, or I, I call them methods, I mean everything, properties, methods, functions, Whatever. When I say method, I use that as a generic term of anything inside the uh, class that you're calling. Attributes are basically uh, tags that we place on top of the actual type to information about that type and how to operate on that type. And you'll see that coming up. In, and I'll point all the attributes out to you when we talk about them, okay? Some attributes are compiler types, uh, compiler attributes. There's actually assembly attributes, uh, which we actually saw last week when we're looking at the manifest, those attributes in there are what we call assembly um, attributes. But most attributes are type attributes. And of course, all types have a declared visibility. So uh, every type, one way or the other, is either public, meaning that that type is exported outside the assembly and can be used by another assembly, or they're assembly types, which means uh, they can only be used within the assembly. And there's even more. Uh, things you can do in, within the assembly itself, which we'll talk about. All types can inherit uh, from a base type if it's only, you know, object. And you can only, it's really important, you can only inherit one type. You can actually implement as many interfaces as you want, uh, but you can only inherit one type. I'm creating a type called circle, and I'm inheriting, and this is the way you inherit in C Sharp, I'm inheriting another type called square. Uh, here's a, an example I actually took. I'm sorry it's small for the guys in the back, um, but this is actually a type minus the actual code uh, from actually my open source assembly. And um, so you can see here at the top, and this is VB, at the top I have my namespace defined, which is called uh, donatips.logging. Okay, so that's my namespace. And then uh, right underneath it, I create my type, which I'm creating a public non-inheritable, which is something you can do in .NET, um, a type uh, called uh, event log trace listener. I'm inheriting a type that's actually in .NET uh, called trace listener. Okay, so I immediately get all the functionality of trace listener, and uh, then I can do my own coding on top of it. This is an example of um, an attribute. So attributes can be placed on the assembly level, the class level, or the type level, or the method level. So this one's actually a class level. Um, I'm using it as a class level attribute. And it's actually about security. Here's my um, a default constructor in uh, VB, which is just sub new. Trace listener has a, um, an overridable method called close. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating, I'm saying public override sub close, which is the close method, right? So basically what I'm doing right here is I'm overriding the functionality of trace listener and implementing my own. 
So that's called overriding. Creating my own function here called create event uh, instance with some parameters. I also have another method here called trace data. And I, here I'm using another attribute, which is convisible false. So if this um, class was actually visible to outside programming, uh, like a com and things like that, uh, that outside program could not see this method because I put, I put com visible false. And then down here, I'm sorry you guys in the back can't read it, I'm doing another override on property name, then I end my class and end my namespace. 